You recognize that music? All right, at the count of three, you will all stand up and give the warmest rock star applause for Timo Butefish. One, two, three, come on. Ah, all right. You're the best, thank you very much. They didn't bring the beers because you're German, they brought the beers because I'm an alcoholic. Just wanted to get this right well, away. Then cheers. Then cheers, Prost. Thank you. All right. Let's start with the first question. I always start with this one is, have you been welcome on stage as, an, as a rock star before? No, never, so this is quite exciting. Um, actually, there are two seats free now for the people yeah. that are standing. People in the back, you pay to get a if seat you want, if you wanna get the seat over here. Great, thank you for joining us. I always try to break the ice with, uh, let's say if you've got anything you wanna share because you launched something a couple of weeks before, you might wanna start with this and then we will build up in the conversation around mobility. Well, maybe you've seen it, we, we launched a new model of scooters um, in the eCultra app, so that's, I think it's a great uh, new product because the scooter accelerates more, it's a little bit lighter, it's agile, and um, it has also a higher range, so, We'll bring now 1,200 new, new scooters of these. You can already see some of them. They have a different symbol in the app. So please uh, use them. How many of you are current users of Cultra right now? Oh, that's a pretty, pretty decent. How many of you will be users of Cultra after this event? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's a little bit better. Thank you. Can, you. can we start with your story? Because uh, normally we, we interview a lot of people from either Barcelona themselves or people who come from abroad, but they, they reside abroad. They just come here for, for the event and then they fuck off, right? Mm -hmm. But you're an expert, right? So you, you, you decided to reside in Barcelona. When did that happen? Why did that happen? And what did we do for you to, to, to stay here in Barcelona? Yeah, um, I'm actually German. I'm 44 years old. Uh, I did a normal degree, business administration. I studied abroad in different countries. I, I also uh, used to work as a tennis and ski instructor, so that's what I did before. I ended up in management consulting, quite a boring job in, in Munich, and I decided to do an MBA. And my favorite school was really Jesse, which is a pretty good business school here in Barcelona. And that was in 2002. I launched a startup in the flower industry which failed tremendously. Flower. Flower, yeah. yeah. We did online flower selling. Right. Um, there's actually a company now that are doing a pretty good job, Colvin. Um, we did it too early and with not so much money, I actually had to pay back the debts that I acquired during that time until three years ago. So yeah. I actually put um, mm -hmm. around 250,000 um, euros in that venture, which I didn't have. So that was a big uh, failure. I had to go back to the corporate world. I worked as an assistant to the CEO. And I think that's another good message for all of you that think about jumping into the pool and founding because plan B always exists. There's always, I, I looking at you, don't think anybody really has to worry about sleeping under a bridge. So you can always go back to a corporate job. And um, actually when we look at profiles in the company now, we always give a certain a special value to entrepreneurs or people that even failed in their businesses. So don't worry about it. This is why I'm here, to animate you to start your own business. So I went back to corporate world. And then in 2006, we founded Kultra. Because otherwise, we would be talking about flowers. And exactly. Probably I wouldn't have invited yes. you. But <laughs> I'm glad. I mean, flowers, flowers are pretty, pretty nice and beautiful, but they are not as useful as riding a bike throughout the city. When did you arrive here? And uh, w how do you find the city that is different from like now? Because yeah. now it's pretty welcoming, it's easy to set up a company, uh, it's easy to scale it up if you will to find an investor, but not when you started. Yeah, well it's, it's now quite some years ago, so I founded Kultra 13 years ago. Um, the city has definitely changed. I mean, I think for the better, it's much more cosmopolitan. It's a big tech city, um, there's a lot of investment going into this uh, city, there's an ecosystem of startups, great things like Startup Grind. Um, this didn't exist, but um, still, I think if you are very convinced about an idea, there's always uh, people that you can go to and ask for money. Um, we've started Kultra with 
Uh, I personally 30,000 and my co-founders also 30,000 to 60,000 of our own money. We bought 25 uh, Chinese scooters and we rented a small space here next to Sagar Familia and we started uh, handing out flyers in front of Sagar Familia renting scooters to tourists. So that's how it all started, no? And um, it was, yes, a, not, at the end, also not so difficult. I think it's good to speak Spanish when you start a startup here in Spain, but otherwise, um, just a, a conviction about your product and, and always selling, you know, that's, I think, the main, one of the main tasks of us as founders is selling the pitching for the service and, and uh, also finding people that work for you at the beginning, which is obviously now it's, it's a little bit easier to find people but um, that's, I, I guess, one of the most difficult things, no, to, to find talent that works for you for, for a reasonable price. Actually, I think one of your co-founders signed up to the event. I don't know if you're here. Holger is here. I don't know. I haven't seen him. He might. He, he, might he comes ask. for the BSC. Oh, he, <laughs> he knows the story, so. Because I was going to ask, your yeah. co-founder is not from here either. No, we're both German. Um, so how was the story? Because you were friends before being co-founders. What's your take on creating business yeah. with a friend? Yeah, um, very, that's, I think, another lesson learned. You're I want still to, friends with him after yes, seven years, yes, so yes. probably something yes. went wrong. The, the, the only thing which, in my case, in our case, was different, we didn't have symmetric roles, so it was always clear that I was running the business and he was uh, in the back, an, an investor. I think it's very helpful as an advice to to start the business with another partner. I wouldn't go alone. I would, if I have to redo it, I would always do it with two. And I think it's very good if they're symmetric in terms of money they put in, in terms of time and commitment they put in. And I think it's very good if you guys are complementary. If you're a girl, look for a boy. If you're from Asia, look for a person from Europe. If you're a tech guy or girl, look for a marketing person. The more complementary and diverse you are, the better you are, the better you're off. But always a partner because I have been in the last 13 years often a little bit lonely also and that's it's not it's not easy because you are in in between the management team and the investors we will talk later about the financing I guess um, but but it's not not an easy role so if you are two at the same level that's perfect how do you deal with the bad situation bad times you know every every entrepreneur has his highs and lows mm -hmm. and the persons who actually are there to support you are your co-founders so but, you know, maybe you have some debates, like arguments yeah. and all of that. How did you solve this with this co-founder? Maybe it never happened? What was your... No, no you actually, it? there wasn't, because our roles were so clearly distinct. Yeah. I was always the CEO and uh, they were in the background. I was managing the business. And that's also good advice. Find investors that let you run the business. Great. You don't want to get investors on board that tell you how to run the business because then it's already the problem started, right? Because there is a clear role between management and investors. There are people that put capital in and that you report to every four, mo four months or three months or every month, but it's actually the management team that has to run the business. Talking about difficulties, uh, uh, it, it's essential to look after the cash. Don't worry at the beginning about the profit and loss. Look on your bank account every day because that's where you understand if you have enough money to run the business for the next uh, three months. And um, make sure you, you plan for a lot less revenue than your business plan and a lot more cost than in your business plan. And um, actually that's, I think, the number one reason why startups fail in the first year. It's because they run out of liquidity. So manage the cash accordingly. Don't hire too many people that you cannot pay. Try to sell as crazy to make the top line so you get money in. Because actually there are only two ways to get money in, right? It's either from investors and banks or from customers. So the best job and the cheapest money you can get is from happy paying customers, no? Mm -hmm. And I think, so that's a big advice to look after your, your bank account. Was it a good idea because you were giving out flyers in front of Sagrada Familia yeah. and you know tourists are there, tourists are willing to spend money. So your actual, your business validation was that one just to go and meet your potential customers and how did you face the rejection of people who didn't want to pay for it or didn't trust you yeah. at the beginning? Yeah, I think it's also interesting that uh, with the business model that we started off renting to tourists, 
it's, uh, it's only a very small part now of what is Cool Drug Group, right? We do, um, we do not only tourist rental, we rent now to fleets, scooters like Domino's Pizza, Burger King, Police. Um, we do the sharing and we also have a last mile business. Um, we are now 600 people and we really pivoted the business many, many times. And I think that's also, I think at the end, it's, it's, there should be a market opportunity and a good team, but it doesn't, like, you don't have to do what you do at the beginning, what you end up doing now. And, and um, when you say, yes, we started with the tourists, and, um, and I think that was also uh, a good learning that we did. We actually, before we raised the first round, which was after one year after founding, we actually had 100,000 euros in revenue from customers, and that helped us to put the first valuation already in 3 million. And um, that's very helpful, so an advice to start really get customers paying and get a minimal value, uh, viable product also running. Because then if you talk to business angels or seed investors, you're much more credible if you can show that instead of only a paper business plan. Why did you decide to raise if you were, I don't know if you were cash flow positive, but at least you were making money mm -hmm. and significant money. Why did you decide to raise so early yeah. in just yeah. one year? Yeah, uh, you want to have more structure? Yeah, learning, um, learning and looking back, the best thing you can guys do if you start is try to keep investors away as long as you can, right? Mm -hmm. So because And investors <laughs> in the room, you see, we keep them away. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> Because at the end, um, it's just a reflection, no? Because sometimes in the press, uh, success of, like successes of financing or, or, or getting big rounds in are celebrated more than building a sustainable business. And I think the later one is much more difficult. Raising a round as such is just a start. And having the money on the bank account is nothing. Because at the end, it happens when you have to execute and really make the business run. And that's what is uh, actually much more difficult than only uh, raise, raising the round. So what we did is we wanted to grow really quickly. And we also decided to have a very asset intensive business because we have to buy all these scooters. We have now 15,000 scooters in total. So we had to buy all these. If you can set up a business that doesn't require so heavy investment, do it much better. Right, and so we had, in order to buy more fleet, we, do, we did have to dilute very early, right? So we have to give away a lot of equity at the beginning, and that's a problem. So everything you can in maintaining your own equity and being under control. If you can keep more than 50% of the business, try at any price to do it. Seems that right now you've got a master plan of not only managing, but investing in the mobility scene of Barcelona. But you probably didn't have this plan when you started, mm -hmm. right? So in hindsight, so would you have done the same? Or how did you come up with the idea of not only buying more scooters, which was the original plan to speed up the growth and all of that, but when did you come up with the idea of diversifying and adding more layers and more like verticals to your business? But basically listening to the market, so we saw that uh, Car2Go entered in Madrid with uh, sharing cars. Do you guys know it's a, it's a car sharing, like we do motor sharing here? And we thought, wow, that's a cool idea. We should copy that for our scooters. So we, we, we started developing with our uh, provider a shared scooter, and we started um, the, the motor sharing, right? And um, for example, another pivot we did at the beginning is we had people or we had companies that were renting from us scooters instead of tourists, right? So we started really to v develop the B2B activity. So we bought a different type of scooters, delivery scooters, and we are now renting to all these B2B customers. For example, expanding too much uh, geographically is an error. Always try to really, really penetrate and and um, get a big market share in cities where you are because each growth is perfect for PR and for, for gr telling a great story, but it's always a headache. So we grew way too quickly at the beginning. We are now in six countries in 30 cities, and I wish we wouldn't have gone so quickly because it's, very, it's so much easier to control if you're in one place and really have a good, good market share there instead of having small shares in, in many cities. And uh, 
because of that, I wanted to like single out something because you know our buddy here, Carlos, he runs Fuck Up Nights, and it's a really, really fun event. I always encourage people to go. And but I want you to say which one has been your biggest business fuck up. Mm -hmm. If you can share. Yeah. No. Uh, we can censor it out for a price. But yeah, yeah. No. Um, there's there, <laughs> there there are many. No. But. Um, All right. We've got only twenty yeah, yeah, no, five minutes. Um, <laughs> Basically, the biggest problem is always in hiring the wrong people. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the most important process in an organization is the selection process. Mm -hmm. Because if you get the right person on board, everything else afterwards goes fine. And it's 80%, really. It is so important to get the right people, even if they, they don't have the qualifications, because all this you can learn. But the selection process is so key. I try to get involved in the selection process as much as I can. I don't, I'm not able to do it all the time, but it, that's actually always the same. It's like you realize then after two or three months it's not the right person, and that's, that's, when it's, that's the biggest disaster because you start again. No? You have to fire that person, look, and you start over. So that's really always has been, it has been always on the people's side. It seems to me that you're that kind of CEO that's pretty much on top of everything. I don't, I don't know whether you micromanage or not, but I think you, you're not the type of CEO that would say, like, don't ask me about financials, don't ask me about hiring, don't ask me about mm -hmm. this because I don't know anything. Yes. I'm just focused on product. I'm just focused on, on sales mm -hmm. or fundraising. It's part of the secret sauce of Kultra that you are involved in all the areas, and maybe that's why you spot always the different opportunities yeah. in the business ask market. My, some of my teams are here. They hate me. How many people <laughs> from Kultra are here? Uh, if we're more than 50% of the room, no. all right, yeah. <laughs> no, you, they, 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 they know I'm quite on top. Yeah. Um, there are different leadership styles, definitely. Um, I personally have to learn more to delegate. But I think, uh, for example, I'm, I'm very much for a, a flat hierarchy. So I have in total 15 people reporting to me. There are CEOs that say, no, I only want five reports. Um, but if you are... I th well, for example, the, if you read, there's a great business book. It's called How Google Works. Fantastic yes, book. Fanta it's really good. One of the best uh, uh, books. I can also recommend two more, which I really like, but How Google Works. They talk about minimum 10 reports, and I agree. I think the more flat you have, you more control, you more vision you have as a CEO, and it's also for managers. So, um, yes, but I think it's, it's very important to know when to delegate, and we are now also in the lucky position in the last years, we have hired very good um, people, managers also from, from outside. So then it's much easier, no? And um, yeah, and scaling up, it's absolutely necessary to also hire external talent because you cannot only grow with people that grow inside. That's not healthy. So right now in our management team, we have a good mixture, people that have industry experience, but also people that are with me from the beginning. So I think that's pretty good. And when, as a CEO myself, one of the struggles uh, I find while scaling up a company is that that fear of missing out, right? You like to be over-informed. You like to have a lot of people, inf not only directly reporting to you, but you like to be assisted to a lot of emails, which you probably don't really need to. Mm -hmm. So how do you overcome that fear of missing out, if you have at all? No, well, I'm, I'm working big hours still. I mean, I think this is also yeah. something um, there are two basically characteristics that I've seen in other um, CEOs that I consider successful. First of all, all of them are working many hours. I don't see anybody that has a success that doesn't work many hours. And secondly, they're reading a lot. And I think that's really the two characteristics that I've seen in common. Then there are different um, leadership styles. You know, there are people that are really hands off and, and let people completely delegate and only work with like, um, and, and maybe another thing which also works is a good um, meeting structure. Um, this is like the rhythm, it's like dancing. If you have every week a meeting with your leadership team, with individual meetings, it's very important to an organization because you get people responsible and have them report to you. I think that helps us a lot. And it also is a, a way to, um, to, to get communication inside the organization. Because once you are many people, the biggest uh, challenge is actually to connect everybody in the organization. We are now 600, so there are many people out there that I cannot talk personally to. And so it's, it has to go through the ladder. 
And that's why it's so important, this communication. It's, it's one, I would say it's our top three challenges, is how to communicate to everybody in the organization. And uh, yes, we can use uh, like new technology, no? But what, it's, what tools do you use actually to communicate yeah, a well, company uh, that big? Yeah, we, we're just implementing uh, Slack. Yeah. Um, <coughs> uh, but 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 I'm I'm crazy. I'm like creating WhatsApp groups, whatever. You know, I, it's for it different just, departments. It, it, yeah, for for all kinds of stuff. <laughs> so um, yeah, we're using way too much email. But um, we also try to do, for example, this morning I tried to gather everybody in a. Uh, together in an all hands meeting, which is also very good. Mm -hmm. I know, for example, Oscar Pierre from Globo, they do every Monday morning in all hands, 8.30. All hands in Globo, everybody connects from all over the world. And he talks as a CEO. So it's, mm -hmm. this is so important um, to this communication. Uh, you've mentioned, so working long hours, which we're going to go into that. But first of all, I'm very interested in the reading a lot. We don't talk a lot about books here. Mm -hmm. We might assume that maybe a lot of entrepreneurs are really busy and maybe they don't have time to, book, to read books, but some of them have mentioned this. So what are the other two books you mentioned that you want to share? Uh, there, there many, there's one very good. It's called uh, The Hard Things About the Hard Things. Ben Horowitz. Yes, um, very good book. Uh, very fun also to read. Mm -hmm. um, then there's a, Vern Harnish. He's, it's a book, Scaling Up. It's more about the phase when you scale up from 10 to uh, 500 employees. So that's an amazing group. And then there's one which is called Zero to One, um, Good to Great. Yeah, these are probably my, my favorite. Um, on, the, on the account of the working long hours, there are two different schools here, right? The ones that advocate for, you know, work hard, play hard. Mm -hmm. uh, companies like Uber, WeWork, things like that, that they, are, they work extremely long hours but they, because they say they are data-driven or goal-driven or whatever, but it might mean also that they squeeze you mm -hmm. till you're the milk you, till you, you're <laughs> exhausted. And the other companies, which you might say they're not successful, are companies like Basecamp, multi-million dollar businesses, they advocate for a maximum of 40 hours per week. Mm -hmm. So how is that compatible and what is your daily yeah. schedule like? Well, the, the objective always is to, to, to make a, a place attractive for your employees, no? Yeah. As I said, for, for us, the most important thing is that the people feel well. So. Um, I think giving them the maximum flexibility is extremely important. I think that's especially what the young people are valuing, no? the flexibility. Um, and then working on interesting projects. I think that's the most important thing that the, the people, for example, we are now with almost 50% of our scooters are electric. So people, I think, in the organization really feel that we're improving the air in the cities where we live and mm -hmm. we, give, we give really a cool product to the society. So that's, I think that's an additional add-on. Um, and yeah, there, there are moments of hard work, but um, uh, I mean, we are flexible. People can come in whenever they want. Um, you never, you can't oblige a person to do long hours. It's also obviously, it depends a lot, no, on the level in the organization, no? When you're in a higher level, I think it's more expected to do longer hours. Um, while uh, on other levels, I understand also, according to the pay, that you're more strict with the work, the hours you work. How did you, so what is your company culture like? And did it suffer from scaling from zero people to 600 employees? Because Ben Horowitz, he says that I think it's after 40 people, company culture breaks, mm -hmm. something like that. I don't know the exact number, right? Yeah. Uh, and I totally also recommend that yeah. book. It's really good. But so how did you manage to keep your company culture? How did it transform and evolve yeah. itself? Yeah, it's a very good question. It's one of our biggest challenges to maintain the culture that it is. Um, we basically have created three values in our business, no? which is commitment, passion, and innovation. So we also do value-based uh, uh, interviews. So that's what we look because it all is about the selection process, the culture, the people. So um, you, as a leader, can give certain role models, but at the end, it's just important how, what kind of people you are hiring, no? And how do they fit into the, this culture? Um, at, at the end of the day, it's a lot about how the leadership team transmits this culture. It's, I think it's very much up down, up from the, from the top, how you live, how you give answers, how you, how you take decisions. Um, but we have a big challenge. We have, for example, now what we did, 
which was on one hand very smart. We, we, we created Moto Sharing, the eCultra, as a new startup inside our business. So we created an own entity, an own CEO, an own team, etc. But obviously this organization now has a separate culture. It has a separate entity. It goes quicker than the rest of the organization. So for us, now it's actually the, the challenge is to make them all feel that they're part of the same group. And I think this happens to many other businesses when you start separating. Also it happens with geographies. The Italian team has its own culture. The French team has its own culture. And that's really difficult. And sometimes it's not bad to have in one country a, di a little bit different culture. I don't think it's bad, as long as the values are uh, coherent. We had a similar, a similar kind of company, uh, CyberClick Group, uh, uh, Cyber Click group uh, in March 2015. Mm -hmm. um, David Tomas created this aggregation of different marketing companies, one of them around every different kind of uh, buyer persona they had, right? And so they created one for I don't know, for email marketing, the other one for email yeah. marketing, this and that. And that when he was interviewed here, funnily enough, he said like, yeah, it's better to do it like this way. You spin off companies, you give them a separate CEO, this uh, different culture, some really good like initial investment and freedom to do whatever they do. In hindsight, talking to him recently, he said like, this is great on paper, but then you need to manage a lot of expectation, different boards, different investors, different CEOs, different cultures. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a freaking shit show. I mean, he didn't mm -hmm. use these words, obviously. I'm using them for the fun. But, uh, but I, I, I wanted to ask, so are you finding the same? Are you finding that some companies spin off and then they, they drift like very far from the beginning? They're hard to control? Yes. Or how coupled are they to, original, to the original group? No, that, that definitely happens. We have, for example, one last mile delivery business where, mm -hmm. we, where we give service to companies like Amazon, DHL, Just Eat, Uber Eats. So we give the driver plus the scooter. It's actually developed out of a customer need. Wow. So we have a different entity. We have a different CEO. They work in Madrid. And they have a different name, EcoScooting, it's called, right? So they do a complete different business. And actually there, it's right now, it's sometimes more like a financially controlled startup that we have and not so much part of the group. So, But on the other hand, they developed a clear... Um, like advantage of going much faster than on a group level, right? So you, I think it's, it's a trade-off. In that case particular, it's a little bit away from our mobility business. So it has a little bit different strategy, a different business model. Mm. So I don't think it's so bad that they're a little bit more independent. Because you started this 13 years ago, and now everybody is in the mobility mm. Cool trend. Everybody wants to be cool and doing last mile and all of that. But yeah, you were doing around, mobility 13 I think years. they're around now in Spain alone. I think they're yeah. 50 kick scooter sharing companies. Yeah, they're no? the kick scooters. They, now. Everybody thinks it's like the new, the new hype, the no, new gold. No, after Bird and Lime. Will but it be it's like a the really next, difficult business? Will it be the next Google Glass or the next Segway? Like no one really uses it. That no, much. no. It's a good use case, yes. but it's very, very difficult to implement because. First of all, regulation doesn't allow them, right, to go. For example, you haven't seen this in Barcelona, yeah. right, because it's prohibited. And in, in, in Madrid, they recently prohibited as well. Yep. And the second thing, there's much more vandalism and, and theft and, and problems with the product than people expected. No? Like Lime and Bird got these crazy valuations at $2 billion hmm. because they, they convinced uh, investors with unit economics of saying, okay, this scooter brings such and such revenue. It lasts four or five months. But now they actually see a kick scooter like this. There's real big problems with theft, vandalism. Scooters are everywhere on the sidewalks, and, and, and they only last one or two, two months. So it's, I don't think it's very nice on paper. And obviously, we do also at Kutra have our um, kick scooter We're pilot. We're talking the rental ones, not the ones you actually buy for yourself. No, the, yeah, the, the the I'm talking yeah. about the sharing, no? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the sharing of, it's the lime and bird and yeah. business case, no? So, but we, we don't think the market is yet ready to accept them here because there's just so many issues with it. My, my, my question was going to be, so I, I was in, 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 a, in an event this morning about corporate venturing. And we had the guy from ship to b this impact accelerator from Barcelona. And they, he said something that like, struck something in my head. That's by year 2035, all of the companies in the world need to, be, need to have impact as a source of business, right? It's not like something separate. You have your financials. Mm -hmm. But then impact, if 
you know, if you got time for it, yes. right? All of them will be impact driven. You seem to be doing this with, you know, the, the, the electrical scooters, and you mentioned that you're reducing the emissions and all of that. So, what's your plan for this, and when did you came up with this idea? Were you the first guy in Barcelona to think yeah. actually? I'm going to do this? No, I mean, the, maybe the people with my age, they remember. Do you remember you could actually smoke in an airplane? <laughs> Anybody remembers that? Or in a bar? That's how yeah. our children would think about us. <coughs> um, people with combustion vehicles in the cities where we live. It's absolutely yeah, right, yeah. stupid, no? It's really yeah. stupid. And if you think how many people die of respiratory problems in Barcelona, it's much higher than the accidents, right? So yeah. for us, we are very convinced at Kutra to have an all-electric fleet. We're working towards that. The problem right now, there's not, a, not yet a 100% comparable product to the gas scooter if you do longer ranges. Um, but the future, for, for our company at least, in three, three years, it will be all-electric. It will be all-electric, all-connected. I mean, it, and it will be mobility on demand. None of you will ever, in the future, in 10, 20 years, we will not purchase vehicles anymore. You know, the, 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 the board members of companies like Volkswagen, Audi, Mercedes, they are scared to death. Really, because the, the market for cars in the traditional sense, right, this is now, it's not happening. People don't want to buy a vehicle anymore. Yeah. We will consume mobility on demand. The winners of these games will be Google, Uber, the big ones, Diddy. You will have their app on your mobile or any device on your watch or a chip integrated, and you will, you will consume mobility on demand. And you will, you will use per minute a scooter, a kick scooter, a ride sharing. It will be all integrated. And you realize already Uber is going for this. Uber is now buying other verticals. And they will integrate all mobility services in one. Like Google also will go there. So we will be mainly operators that will give service then to companies like Google. So there will be aggregators and um, that will aggregate all these companies, all the mobility. So you will just say, I want to, well, you will probably talk to the device. No, I want to go there and there. And they will give you the best uh, path in terms of mobility. And hopefully, Kultra will be one element in this chain. What can we expect from Kultra in the coming months that you might want to share with a limited audience of only 150 people? Uh, <laughs> that, Not publishing that, anywhere. No yeah, one's watching No, no we, we, we really try to, we have a big user base already. We have more than 500,000 users. Um, in Barcelona alone, we have um, 150,000 users, more than Bsync. We're very proud of that, mm -hmm. and we want to give them even a better service. So we're improving a lot the current service. As you can see, we bring a new model of scooter. Um, we're improving our app. Um, we are working constantly on better customer service. So we are actually trying to consolidate, improving the experience for the existing users. No? Because it's a competitive market. I mean, everybody that uses eCultra will definitely have a second app on their scooter. People use also Yego, Scoot, Moving. It's normal. So we want to be the preferred app. That's why we also put a lot of scooters in the street. Because we know the number one purchasing criteria in our service is, is there a scooter close to you? So you, as we have the most scooters, people open our app and find a scooter close. Mm -hmm. So we have to push a lot of scooters into the market, which is a big challenge because a scooter like this is still very expensive. So for, for me, the challenge is now, how do I finance this tremendous growth no, of buying um, so many scooters? One question that I get about like 10 to 15 times a week, mm -hmm. and since you are hands-on in a, a lot of departments, maybe you're also into the tech department, is how do you hire developers, right? I, I have my answer. I'm not going to share it. But <laughs> I want to hear yours. I'm pretty curious. Yeah, my HR team is here. They, it's, 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 it's really, really <laughs> difficult. We had a strategy of uh, nearshoring, so we opened an office in Tarragona, All right. which is 45 minutes uh, away. And uh, we are basically trying to hire people there because it has an independent university. People, yeah. Some people prefer to live in Tarragona and don't travel. So that's a strategy. And a, a lot via recommendation. I mean, we're paying, for example, an award to our own employees if they bring on a new employee mm -hmm. because that's the best you can do, no? Re via recommendation, 
word to mouth. So you have given up on hiring people in Barcelona, basically? N not, but um, the, comp yeah. the competition is extremely yeah. high. Huh? I yes. mean, uh, you're competing to companies that uh, can pay a lot more, and it's, it's not easy. We try to attract them with an interesting project, because here we, you really work on the forefront of urban mobility, and yeah. the, the tech is really quite cool, because it's a combination between the hardware on the scooter the app, the back end, it's a quite uh, interesting project, I think, for any developer. So, Two last questions from my side, then we open up the floor for questions. First of all, is, you know, one of the core values of Startup Grind is helping others before helping ourselves, right? And by this token, how can we help you? How can we help Timo or Kultra? Uh, um, yes, uh, people is always important. Uh, if you would know people that want to work on a project like ours, Please. Developers. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, customer service, swap us, uh, um, marketing people, anything. So we are always look. That's obviously a reason why I'm here also, no? Yeah. To, to do a employer uh, branding. Um, yes, use our service and send us feedback. Um, if you have any Im improvement, uh, we are happy to, Im we're very happy to hear your comments on customer service. Anything, no, in terms of, uh, of improving the service, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Great. And the last one is, that's the hardest question ever. Everybody's got a useless superpower. Useless superpower. Something you do exceptionally well, mm -hmm. but it's fucking useless. It's like, why do I know this for? It's like, <laughs> what's the use case for this? Oh my god. Which one is yours? That's a really difficult question. You see, we don't prepare the interviews. No. Yeah, like, so. Um, yeah, I'm. I, I'm very. It's useless that I. I'm very, very uh, organized. So I try to have everything very neat on my on my desk. I think that's not very. I think useful. it's useful. Yeah, maybe because it reduces mental yeah, clutter. Yeah, but yes. I think you can do better than that. Give me another answer. Uh, <laughs> because that was useful. Come on. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. it's gonna make you sweat. <laughs> I'm very quick in answering uh, emails and WhatsApps, and that's always a complaint from, from my wife. No, I'm, oh, okay. I, I'm very, very uh, addicted to, to my mobile. Yeah? That's, that's a pretty useless yeah. one. Yes. Big applause for Thank Timo. <laughs> and now, Questions time. Before we go to the networking part, there's questions. We're going to do a, be doing a few. Say your name, one question per person. Please make them generic. Just don't pitch Timo. I know you're not going to do it because it's not your first event, but there's a lot of new people in the audience, so please. Oh, where's the mic? Yeah. Timo, I saw you open in Brazil. And that uh, is both service in Brazil, the electrical and, and the e-contra, and uh, also because you are in six countries, you're also having a team in six countries there, or you're concentrating everything here? Yeah, um, very good question. First the answer is we try to manage as centralized as possible business from Barcelona. So we have a headquarter, which is here in, in, in the port, where we try to centralize customer service, marketing, operations, finance. So we have only operational and customer attention people in the countries. We try to not build up big headquarters. Uh, concerning Brazil, that was actually a more a, a, a personal venture that, we re that I really wanted to, to go to Brazil. And we're there with a partner. So we have a minority stake in that participation. It's, it's, it has been growing, but not, not as we expected. We only do B2B uh, service there. Okay. Next one. Just we uh, don't pay in crypto yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. OK, uh, I'm, I'm Joanna. Uh, I just made the, yeah. <laughs> the pitch about crypto. Uh, I wanted to ask you, because I see you're going a lot towards the scooter sharing. Uh, and I'm actually a customer from previously from the long-term rental. And I bought also a scooter through Kultra. I wanted to ask you if this is something that you will discontinue in the future, this sort of service. And you want to focus just on the, on the sharing yeah. part. Very good Thank question. You. No, we, we, we want to use the sharing technology, but also offer the rents for years or months <coughs> or days. So if you are 
actually now registered, for example, in Ecultra here in Barcelona, and you go to Ibiza for a vacation, you can just walk into a, a zone, let's say the airport, and you can un unleash the scooter and you get Im immediately charged the daily rent. Right, so we want to combine the two services, but we will not, we will not uh, stop offering monthly rent or yearly rent. We still right. do that. Another one over there. Hi, I'm Atman from Belgium. Um, I have the feeling like you're uh, following the path of Google with Alphabet, and I would like to know when you implement a different entity or creating a new one. How do you deal with culture shock when they are becoming so independent? Yeah, y yes, it, it, it's a very good question. Um, as I said, we promote at the beginning, no, that they go independently and we give them an own budget and own CEO and own team, no. But then at one moment they have to understand that there is a synergy in the group, no, and there's a lot of things that make sense to make them on a group level. For example, HR, finance, legal. Everything, I think what we try to do is everything which is customer oriented, we try to keep on a local level, right? But everything which is on the back end, we try to centralize in order to get synergies. Purchasing, for example, no? If we purchase scooters, it makes a lot of sense to go to a big provider and say, hey, we want to buy 5,000 scooters, no? As an example. Right. Next one. I think there's a couple others over here. My name is Arturo from Barcelona. I'm a, I'm, I am an Ecultra user. Uh, I came here with uh, the new model for the first time to this event, and I can tell this is a very great improvement. So Thank you. That's some feedback. Congratulations. Thank you. I have three quick questions, if possible. <laughs> uh, Are they yes, no questions? <laughs> yes. OK, that's it. <laughs> well, two yes, one no. <laughs> do, do you pay to Ajuntament of Barcelona for the use of of the service or for having the service uh, working? We ha will have to pay in one, one year. You, you will have to pay in one they year? They will okay. put, uh, uh, which we consider not correct, but they will put us, uh, 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 how do you say, una tasa. Yeah. OK, OK. They put us a fee. OK. And do you move scooters during night as Vithin does? Only if they haven't been moved by themselves during seven days, which rarely happens. OK. And what dashboard tool do you use for monitoring scooters, if you can tell it? The back end? The, yeah, the dashboard uh, tool you used for monitoring, statistics, et cetera. Yeah, we have a, we have a whole back end which we developed with, with a partner company. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, I don't know if you know how we, how we, we swap the batteries. So there are actually people riding around in electric vans, and they swap the batteries. Uh, one, one or every one or two days, and we bring them to a large charging hub where we charge them all together with uh, renewable energy. So we're quite proud because we close the circle. We use renewable energy and electric vans to charge. Okay, thank you. Last time I checked, when there were people with vans taking the bicycles or the bikes inside, they were not actually swapping the batteries. They, not that, yours, but okay, you say that, in Barcelona, that, you know, might, it's pretty... that, <laughs> that might be, hopefully, these are not people that bring them to another country. Exactly. And exactly. sell them. <laughs> because this also There's a saying for that in German, actually. <laughs> yeah. but. Uh, my name is Pavel, and I live here in Barcelona. And uh, it seems that we are going into the direction of Google in means of the dividing company to the other services. and. I'm interested, what happens to the um, data that you collect? So you obviously collect a lot of data about the behavior of the people, and it's, it's available, available uh, information. So do you sell it? Do you plan to sell it? How it works? Yeah. Um, the data is extremely interesting. Uh, because we, there's, there's not, like imagine we have a fleet of, for example, in Barcelona, more than a thousand scooters that are moving seven or eight times every day. So there's a lot of useful data, no? And one of the obligations of the new regulation, because the service will be regulated, is to share consolidated data with the local government, which we think is okay. They use it to improve the infrastructure, no? to study accidents, etc., which is perfect. And we really think, like, at one moment, we can also exploit and sell the data in a consolidated way. Um, we, we are now hiring a data analyst exactly to go into this direction. So far, we are not commercializing the data. Um, and 
and it's actually interesting from an investor point of view. Uh, you know that there are these uh, bike sharing companies, M Mobike and Ofu. And if you look at the investors that go in there, there are a lot of e-commerce companies. Like Alibaba, for example, invested in, I think it's Mobike or Ofu, I don't know now which one, because they think in the future, through the app, you can sell other services. So if you drive by a Starbucks coffee, no, they offer you a discount to, to grab a coffee, for example. Or they recommend you the hotel or, or whatever. Life, like it's in China. <laughs> right. Can we take the last one? Last question. Over there. Yeah. That, the red back. Yeah. Hi, my name is Lazar. As you know, I'm from Serbia. I have a little bit different question. Well, since you are an entrepreneur yourself, what do you think if there are more opportunities for us young entrepreneurs uh, today and in the future than back in the past? Thank you. It, 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 it's now easy to say, no, it's much easier now. Uh, but I think I, I want to give it a positive note. I really do think it's easier now because you guys have, through technology, an incredibly open space. You can uh, run a business from Barcelona but operate in Serbia, right? And this is fantastic, no? And um, I think, uh, concretely, Barcelona is much more open-minded. If you see the statistics, I think in Europe, it's number city number four where the amount of investment goes in, right? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's like Berlin, London, Paris, Barcelona. It's really amazing. And guys, don't worry. For example, I did uh, five uh, financing rounds in total. I raised uh, 50 million euros during different rounds. There's so many no's. You know, like you write to 150 funds and you get uh, so many no's. So don't worry, just keep insisting. And if they don't answer, keep writing. Keep writing uh, to, and you, you will find people that, that help you and get, give, get, get you financing. One last thing from me. First of all, are you an investor? I don't know that. Do you invest in startups? I'm, I'm actually invested in a business that, that uh, offers cleaning services. All right. <laughs> so I, I, will, I will tell you about it. Yes, um, I, I, but I do very small, small amounts. OK, because I, I got this really funny, funny, funny answer when I asked this very same question to the founder of Shazam. Uh, would you have invested in Kultra when you started? Mm. Yes? Uh, yes. He said no. <laughs> okay. He wouldn't have invested in his own company. I think looking back, when how we started, I think it's it was not a great concept. But how, with the help of the team, we have developed it now into such a, uh, yeah, I think a cool mobility company. I think now, yes, I would buy shares. Great. That's a good answer. All right. So before we go to the uh, to the networking part, some final words. Says, don't pile up here. We're gonna unmic. And we're coming over there, there's some food, just meet the sponsors, talk to people, mingle each other. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Standing ovation for Timo. Thank you. Thank you.